Hey everyone, uh, we are starting a new chapter today. So this is chapter 14, quotient groups. Um, some authors, maybe even your book, I don't know, some, some authors call them factor groups. I, I just tend to use the word quotient group. So, I mean, just be aware. If you see factor group, it means exactly the same thing as a quotient group. <clears throat> and, you know, we're really getting into the heart of group theory and really algebra. This idea of quotient is one of the, the, the key constructions, one of the most important concepts in, in, um, <clears throat> in abstract algebra. And so we start off um, <clears throat> like this. So a subgroup drop the definition subgroup say uh, uh, I probably want to use oh no H is fine so a subgroup H of G is normal if the left cosets always equal the right coset so if for all little g in capital G <clears throat> G times H is equal to H times G Right, so this is something that sometimes happens, sometimes does not happen, right? Sometimes left cosets are equal to right cosets, sometimes not. In the case that for every choice of element in G, left coset, corresponding left and right cosets are equal, and you run through all possible elements of G and you always get equality, then you say that the subgroup H is a normal. Uh, the notation... So what we do is we write, in the case that it's normal, we write a little triangle symbol. And so you'd read this, H is a normal subgroup of G, right? And, and I mean, really, what happened here in the subgroup symbol, right, you just close off that other end, that stands for normal subgroup. <clears throat> um, so here's one sort of obvious example. Uh, if... G is a billion, then, um, or, and H is any subgroup of G, then uh, 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 H is actually a normal subgroup of G. So every subgroup of an abelian group is normal. And why is that? So reason. We can just kind of crank it out here. So um, G times H is equal to <clears throat> the set of all things in the form little g, little h, where little h runs through all capital H. Because the group is abelian, we can turn this around and write this as HG, where H runs through all of capital H. And then this is capital H times G. All right. So in the setting, in the abelian setting, you kind of just get this for free. This is not always the case. So notice this example right here. And so I want to write a warning here. In general, when we have GH equal to HG, this does not mean, so this does not mean that g, little g times little h equals little hg for all <clears throat> uh, little h in capital H, right? So these, when we write this, this is equality as sets, not equality element by element, right? So be careful, right? Um, <clears throat> right, this is, this is, this is one place where students tend to make mistakes, and I can remember the exact moment when the light bulb went on for me and I realized, oh, this is not what happens. Just because we have these sets equal does not mean that a typical or a, a random GH is equal to HG inside here, right? So this is a set equality, not an element by element equality. Yep, I can still remember exactly where I was sitting when I suddenly realized, oh, now I get it. And, and, and it's really, this is crucial, this is a crucial understanding that you need when working with normal subgroups. Right? You need to understand how this works. 
Um, oh, here was a homework problem that you had. So uh, as an example, if, um, if the index is two, so if the index of H and G is, is equal to two, uh, then H is normal in G. That was in homework number, uh, I think it was in homework number five is where, you, where you're supposed to show that. Um, so for example, continuing with this, we know that um, AN has index two. And so that turns out, that, or that tells us then that AN, the alternating group, is always a normal subgroup, subgroup of SN. <clears throat> um, another example, so let's say in S sub 4, let H equal, um, so it's going to be this subgroup right here, E one, two, three, four. And one, two times three, four. So you can check easily that this actually is a subgroup of S4. Now, I want to look at the following cosets. Um, I'm doing my board work kind of ugly here. <clears throat> so let's look at, um, so we'll say now, um, if I do. 1, 3 times h, so the left coset is going to be um, 1, 3. So remember what I'm going to do, I'm going to multiply each element on the left by the element 1, 3. So we'll get 1, 3, then we'll get um, <clears throat> 1, 3 times 1, 2. And let me see, do I want to write these out? Oh, you know, I want to write these as, as cycles when I can. So um, it's going to be 1, 2, 3. And then it's going to be um, three, four, one. And then the last one is going to be uh, three, four, one, two. So you can check by multiplying each of these elements by, by the uh, transposition one, three, and then express everything in disjoint cycle notation, you actually get cycles all the way through. And then we can say, while, uh, H times 1, 3 is equal to 1, 3. And then we get um, 3, 2, 1. Then we get <clears throat> uh, 1, 4, 3. And then we get um, 1, 4, 3, 2. So comparing these two, we can conclude, so conclusion, um, a H is not a normal subgroup of S4. Right? It is a subgroup, but it's not normal because we have an example right there of a left coset not equal to a right coset. And as soon as it fails one time, that means that it's not a normal subgroup. Um, another example for any group capital G, um, let's let Z of G, so it's written, let's write it down here, um, Z, oh, Z of G equal the set <clears throat> of all, what symbol do I want to use here? Um, all little x. So all x in g, such that xg is equal to gx for all uh, g in capital G. So z of g is the set of all elements in g that commute with everybody. And I think you saw this in an example or in a homework problem, actually. Um, <clears throat> so it has a name. So Z of G is the center of G. And you showed in a homework that the center is actually a subgroup 
of G, right? So uh, you showed that Z of G is a subgroup of G. And what we'd like to do is show that it's actually always a normal subgroup. <clears throat> <laughs> and it's kind of the same thing as when it's abelian. It's essentially the same proof. So um, we'll say if, <clears throat> if capital G uh, is in, uh, sorry, if little g is in capital G, then, um, uh, 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 or, or, and little x is in the center of G, then Gx is equal to xg, uh, for all um, uh, little x in the center. And so, um, g times zg is equal to zg times g. That is, the center is a normal subgroup. So now I want to consider this. Um, if uh, H is a subgroup of G and little g is an element of capital G, then little g H, little g inverse, which by definition, all right, so I'm de really defining this notation G H G inverse, but it's the obvious thing, little g, little h, little g inverse, where little h runs through all of capital H. This has a name, it's called, so this is a conjugate of capital H. We introduced this term conjugation or conjugate um, earlier, um, I guess it was in the last lecture, right? Anytime if you take a little, you know, an element g on the left, and an element G inverse on the right, and multiply, that's called conjugation. <clears throat> um, so note, let's say note, that um, if I look at G, E, G inverse, uh, that's the, let me write it a little better, E, which equals G, E, G inverse, that's an element of G, H, G inverse, and so, Um, G, H, G inverse, definitely not the empty set, all right, so at least has the identity in it. Um, so given, so let's see, I, I want to take, I'm, I'm just going to, I want to show that, that a conjugate is a subgroup, so I'm applying the subgroup test right now. Um, so let's say that we take G, H, G inverse, and G, H hat, G inverse, in G, H, G inverse. Note that um, well, if I multiply, we get G, H, G inverse times G, oh, G, H hat, G inverse. <clears throat> and when you multiply this out, this is G, H, H hat, times G inverse, and notice H, H hat, that lives in capital H, so this object right here lives in G, H, G inverse. And so, let's finish this sentence off, and so, um, G, H, G, H is closed under multiplication. Um, I want to show that it's closed under inverses also, um, so we'll say also, note that, uh, so let's see now, who would the inverse of GHG inverse be? So also note that GH inverse G inverse, that's definitely an element of a, uh, 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 GH G inverse, and if we multiply G H G inverse times G H inverse, 
uh, G inverse, <clears throat> what happens? Well, first you get cancellation in the middle, then the H's cancel, then the G's cancel, so what do we get is E. And so, um, G H G inverse is closed under inverses. So our conclusion then Every time you start off with a subgroup, you can create this thing called the conjugate of H. All right, so conclusion. G, H, G inverse is a subgroup, uh, oh, is a subgroup of G. All right, so the conjugation preserves subgroups. <clears throat> Now, the reason we want this is for our, our first result here. So um, this is theorem 14.1, and this has a name. It's called the normal subgroup test, right? And it allows us to check whether we've got a normal subgroup or not. And so it goes like this. Um, Let's let H be a subgroup of G. Uh, then the following are equivalent. And there's three parts to this. Part A, uh, H is a normal subgroup of G. Um, Part B, um, uh, 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 yep. G, H, G inverse is a subgroup, or uh, sorry, is a subset of H for all um, G in capital G. And part C, G, H, G inverse is equal to H for all little g and capital G. <clears throat> so what this does is it gives us a way to decide whether we've got a normal subgroup or not. And so typically the way you apply this theorem is you use part B, right? That's the easiest one. If you can show that GHG inverse is contained in H for all choices of little g, right? Then you can conclude that you've got a normal subgroup. And also here's the amazing part. If it's a subset, then you get equality, right? So that's kind of nice. <clears throat> Um, for the proof, all right, so we need to go in a circle. So what when we say the following are equivalent, what that means is if one of them is true, then all of them are true. If one of them is false, then all of them are false. So what that means is we're going to do A, we're going to prove A implies B, then B implies C, and then C implies A. <clears throat> So for the forward direction, or it's not the forward direction, for the A implies B direction, um, so we're going to assume, so let's assume that H is a normal subgroup of G. And then um, <clears throat> let's choose an element. So let's pick um, a little G in capital G and let... Um, Call it little x be in the conjugate g h g inverse. So remember, what we're trying to do, we're assuming that this is true, and I want to show that this is true, so I need to show that the left hand side is a subset of the right hand side. Okay? So I've chosen somebody in the left hand side, I need to show that it lives inside the right hand side. Now, <clears throat> Um, okay, what does that mean? So then, um, little x is equal to g h g inverse for some uh, little h in capital H. <clears throat> so now, <clears throat> now, um, okay, so that means that, uh, let's see, x times g is equal to g times h. So I multiplied this equation on the right-hand side, both uh, uh, 
both sides of the equation on the right by g. Um, g times, or little g times little h, that lives in g times capital H, which, because we're assuming normality, that's equal to h times g. <clears throat> and so, um, let's see, x times g is equal to, um, i to use a different symbol, how about h hat times g? For some, um, uh, h hat in capital H. And now, <clears throat> what does that tell us then? Well, by doing cancellation, right, we see that our x actually equals this h hat, so um, it follows that um, x is an element of capital H, therefore, Uh, the left-hand side, g, h, g inverse, is contained. And this is just containment. It doesn't have to be subgroup. Therefore, g, h, g inverse is contained in h. Okay, so now we're going to do b implies c. Oh, b implies c. And to do that one, um, so what do we do? We assume that G, H, G inverse is contained in H. And now I want to show equality, which means I need to choose somebody in the right-hand side and show that it lives in the left-hand side. <clears throat> uh, and this should be for all, so for all. Um, little g in um, uh, capital G. So let's pick somebody... Um, so let's pick little h in capital H. <clears throat> um, then if I multiply, let's say, g inverse h g, that's going to be an element of um, g inverse capital H, G, which we know is contained in H, right? We know that this is true for all G, this, this, uh, this containment right here. In particular, it holds for all inverses. <clears throat> all right, so that's all I did is I multiplied by inverse on the left and the inverse of the inverse on the right. Um, so we can say, and so... Um, uh, what does that tell us? That tells us that G inverse H G is equal to, let's say, H hat for some, um, H hat in capital H. Now, what do we want to do? We want to say something about H. <clears throat> so now, uh, H which equals g h hat g inverse. So what I did, I multiplied on the left by g, on the right by g inverse. And that is an element of g h g inverse. Therefore, so what just happened there, I started off in capital H, I ended up in g h g inverse. So therefore, h <coughs> is contained in G, H, G inverse. Um, okay, one more to do. C implies A. So now we're going to assume that we have equality. So assume that um, uh, g h g inverse is equal to h for all little g in capital G. 
And then what I need to do is prove, um, prove that, that, that H is a normal subgroup. So let's let, um, so, so, so let's pick uh, X in G times H. Um, so then <clears throat> X is equal to G little h or some little h in capital H. Now, what do I need to do? I need to show that X lives in H times G. I'm trying to show that GH is a subset of HG. Um, so let's see. Um, right. So now the, the trick, if you like, so then I need to make use of this fact right here. So then X times G inverse is equal to G H G inverse which is an element of, um, uh, uh, this is an element of, who's an element of, it's an element of G, H, G inverse. And we know that this is equal to H. <clears throat> so it follows that X, G inverse is equal to H hat or some uh, H hat in capital H. So now what can we say? So now multiplying by G on both sides, uh, on the right hand side of both sides of the equation, what we get is X equals H hat G. That's an element of um, capital H times G. Therefore, Um, GH is a subset of HG. And if you want the reverse containment, it's basically the same proof. So we need to say similarly. Um, HG is contained in GH. So that completes the proof. Um, <clears throat> And I do want to say one thing here, and this is this sort of captures the essence of how to work with normal subgroups, right? When a left coset is equal to a right coset, it does not mean that GH is equal to HG. That is false, but what it does mean is that GH is equal to H hat times G for some other element in capital H. That is the important part. It's like that, All right? So when you're working with normal subgroups, that's the thing that you want to remember and be aware of. Um, well, yeah, okay. So <clears throat> let me just say this. So typical use of uh, the normal subgroup test what we typically do and I and I mentioned this earlier um, so use uh, part B to show that um, and really you can use it to prove or disprove so let's um, say prove or disprove normality And so let me just do, do one example here. Um, we show that um, uh, SLNR is actually a normal subgroup of GLNR. We showed subgroup, so now we just need to show um, the normality part. <clears throat> um, so let's see. Let's let A be an element of G, L, and R. Now, if I want to show that S, L, and R is a normal subgroup, what I need to do is show that every conjugate is contained inside 
So every conjugate of S L and R is contained inside S L and R. Um, so let's um, so we'll say and uh, let uh, B be an element of A times S L and R times A inverse. <clears throat> So then, um, B, let's see what B has to look like. It has to look like A times C times A inverse for some uh, C in S, L, N, R. All right, now what am I trying to do? I want to show that S, L, N is a normal subgroup, so I'm going to use part B of the normal subgroup test, which means... What does it mean? It means that I need to show that B is in S, L, N, R. And to do so, what do I need to do? I need to take the determinant. So now, the determinant of B is equal to the determinant of A, C, A inverse. That's going to equal the determinant of A times the determinant of C times the determinant of A inverse. That's equal to the determinant of A times 1, right? Since C lives in S, L, and R, its determinant is 1. And then times 1 over the determinant of A. Remember, the, the, the determinant of the inverse is the reciprocal of the determinant of the original. That's equal to 1. And so B is an element of S, L, and R. R. What did we just show? We can say thus. Um, <clears throat> uh, 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 a, S, L, and R times A inverse is contained in S, L, and R. So by the normal subgroup test, we can make our conclusion. So I'm running out of space here. <clears throat> So by the normal subgroup test, uh, S, L, N, R is a normal subgroup of G, L, N, R. And um, that's as far as I want to go today. So we're going to leave off there and see you next time.